my name is Sean Gulick. I'm a research professor uh, at the Jackson School of Geosciences um, at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, and I do research on, on a variety of things, but uh, uh, in particular, I have been for many years now studying impact cratering as a process and the specifics of uh, the Chicxulub impact um, in Mexico 66 million years ago um, and, and its effects, including uh, the mass extinction that it caused that is most famous because of the death of the non-avian dinosaurs. So the most recent work that the expedition has produced that uh, was published just a couple of weeks ago now um, was led by Stephen Godiris out of the Free University of Brussels. Um, and it was actually the culmination of something that we noticed back in 2016, which was there was metal enrichment at both the top and the bottom of a layer that we called the transition zone. So it was sort of, you know, less than a meter thick. And it was a layer that is the transition from clearly impact related materials to regular limestone that deposits over a long period of time. One of the things to realize is that today, uh, the impact crater is um, half onshore and half offshore of the Yucatan Peninsula. So for instance, the capital of the state of the Yucatan is Merida, um, which is in the impact crater. Um, but you wouldn't know that if you drive there because it's all buried by the last 66 million years of, of sediments, of limestones primarily. If you were to be able to peel away the 66 million years of, of rock, you would find a completely preserved large impact, the best preserved large impact on Earth. Um, and therefore we could do things like target the, the peak ring and drill into a feature of large impact craters that um, the next best place to go do that would be on the moon, you know, <laughs> because they're well preserved there. And, and so to do this, you have to work in very, very shallow water. Right. And so the way that we could uh, make that happen is to use something called a lift boat. So we use the lift boat Myrtle, which came out there and had sort of three legs and they they went down onto the seafloor and lifted the whole boat up out of the water to isolate us from any heave of the ocean. Um, we were about 15 meters or something like 50 feet in the air. And then we hung a, uh, a land uh, drilling rig, usually used for mining, um, off the bow of the ship. And, and basically drilled down into the seafloor and for another you know, 1,335 meters below. So we were only at about 25 meters of water where we set this up. Um, and uh, this kind of drilling is very high RPMs and kind of low weight on the bit, uh, if you can kind of picture that. And so it's really great at making spectacular clean core. So we got almost 100% recovery of what we tried to core, but it's slow. So it took two months to get you know, this really beautiful core. And we could see that there were metals at the top and the bottom of this interval, but we didn't know if any of those metals included material from the asteroid itself, right? So just because they were enriched in iron or nickel or chrome, doesn't mean it didn't come from the hydrothermal system, from the hot springs generated by the impact, as opposed to coming from the asteroid. Um, and so we sent these samples out in, from both intervals, the top and the bottom, to four different laboratories around the world. And it turns out that the top of those two intervals, the one above the transition zone, has the record of the asteroid material um, having basically come back you know, down to the surface of the Earth. Um, and, and this is a really key result because it effectively lays to rest any questions as to whether the Chicxulub impact crater is the one that correlates with the global boundary layer, with the global iridium layer that was originally discovered in, in 1980, um, in that, that actually spawned the whole hypothesis um, of the extinction of the dinosaurs being caused by an asteroid. The timing question is is a, is a really important one to nail down is that are we certain that the mass extinction event that occurred at the end of the cretaceous you know in the very beginning of the paleogene 66 million years ago is exactly the same time as the impact crater and that's what finding the iridium layer inside the crater does for us it but it is not the asteroid material that caused the mass extinction event it's the energy from the asteroid releasing enormous amounts of 
vaporized material and ejecta from the impact site that is the dominant driver um, of the global mass extinction event. Now, if you're closer to the impact itself, then you were actually killed by the energy of the impact. So anything within, you know, 1500 kilometers was uh, likely killed just by the expanding thermal radiation from the impact. But that doesn't explain it being a mass extinction event that killed things on the other side of the planet. That takes an atmospheric effect. And we think the combination of the carbonate dust and particularly the sulfate aerosols and even some contribution of old organic material in the target itself turned into soot that, that all together basically drove the climate in one direction, drove the climate towards cold and, and shut down or reduced greatly photosynthesis, which helps explain why this mass extinction event was a surface extinction event, right? The, surface oceans went extinct, including things like the plankton going extinct at a 90% or greater level, you know, and that's, you know, that's the, the base of the food chain for the surface ocean. So when you kill that, you, you end up causing, a, 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 you know, a knock on effect of, of extinctions. Uh, and on land, similarly, you by reducing photosynthesis, um, you know, you in, in effect, um, have the exact same issue right you know you end up causing a collapse in in the food webs so exploring something like the chicxulub impact event is is i think fundamental to thinking about uh, habitability of our planet and habitability on any planet right so it, it gets you thinking about both the hazards that exist in any world and so we're used to thinking about earthquakes and tsunamis and hurricanes but obviously another hazard are are uh, extraterrestrial impacts Right. And, and that hazard changes depending which planet and when you are in the history of the solar system. So early in our planet's history, there was something called the late heavy bombardment. And if you look at the moon, that incredible amount of cratering you see um, is just a record of that time of that. And, and Earth went through that. It's just that we don't have that record of that incredible amount of impacts. And amazingly, life started somewhere right after, we think, that major impact bombardment. And so there's some linkage, probably, between impacts and life, whether it gave the initial energy and chemo uh, synthetic opportunity for life to get going. That's a pretty exciting idea. Um, also, we should be thinking about today. You know, what's the risk of impacts today? And, you know, we do have many programs that are actually watching the skies, so to speak, for near Earth objects and tracking and to know what's really dangerous, what the effects are. We need to go study one that we're really certain we understand all the parameters of and really nail down how impacts work and what is the real risk of an impact beyond the local place. You know, and, it, and I think studies like this say the real risk is messing with the atmosphere.